Okay, so keep those things in mind when you're interpreting scripture. And that way, if you're wondering, gee, I don't know the Greek, I don't know the Hebrew, I've never read this in Aramaic, am I going to be wrong? I don't know even the history very well. Go, go back to your new interpreter, study Bible, read the opening introduction to the passage. Maybe not all the history you're ever going to get. Do your best. But if you start saying, and therefore, God hates everybody who's a Dodgers fan. Which I've asked God to do that, but um, um, I've been refused. God disappointed me again. But if you get a message like that, you're wrong. Be biblical when you're quoting the Bible. Just wanted to do that. Um, and so to me, the phrase biblical teaching and biblical preaching it has some real substantive questions. Do you mean biblical or do you just mean Bible quoting? And now let's go to one more item, and that is beginning to approach now the substance of this uh, final, this uh, final half an hour. This really dense. Okay, um, your style. Some of you are really emphatic people. You sweat and pain when you preach. And some of you are understated, delicate, elegant. Now, be you. Because I think God is calling you to be you so that people see you be you so that they can think about them being you. I'm not telling you to preach any other way than your core self, but I want you to be your best at your core self. So, let's sum up with some you know, substantive concerns possibilities. I'm going to say some things over again. Some things I'm going to say very differently. To sum up what I've said today, I kind of argue you'll preach better if you preach in themes that go for a sequence, a series. I think the series sometimes can be chosen in advance. October for me is no fear month. And sometimes they'll be chosen not so in advance. I've said to you, you need to plan ahead, and not just Tuesday for this Sunday, <coughs> but some Tuesday for the month of December. And maybe some Wednesday or Thursday for the month of January. And I hope that in planning ahead, series <coughs> are easier to develop. As you move from series to topic, it's all summer, you're going, hey, and it's up over here. As you move from series to topic, I ask you to drive your sense of topic until you know the thing that the writer of the passage meant to say. And I know this is going to be really hard, and I just, if, there's, if you need Kleenex, it, it's all right. But most of the time, the writers of the scriptures didn't mean three different points when they wrote a passage. Mm -hmm. Take care of your soul if this hurts. Usually they had a point to make and they wrote a section to make the point. Now they had a lot of points to make, like most people, so they then made other points. But usually a passage of scripture is making a point. So be slower to make your three-point sermon and quicker to make your one-point message to sing. Uh, Peter Kramer used to use this contrast he had heard from one of his preaching teachers. It's probably better to see a multifaceted diamond if you've only got a minute than to have to study a long string of pearls. I know pastors who they just keep on sharing good thoughts. You don't know where it goes. But they're good thoughts, so you think, well, it must be good because they keep being good, almost related thoughts. If that's you, then at least get it down to a three point sermon, okay? But as a, as a rule, if you're going to really preach a passage, if you isolate the passage or the left side, isolate the passage, it's because that passage probably is an entity. 
sometimes in biblical scholarship they'll use these phrases like a pericope. It basically means a paragraph making a point. Okay? So listen to the point. Try to find the point. And then when you found the point, it may well preach. Preach the point. And you don't have to divide that into three points. Make your first point a great introduction. Right? So, but now as you get to preaching, what do you do? I encourage you to cut that sermon, <coughs> cut that sermon into the world's greatest introduction. And the way to build the introduction is look at your pointer. Look at your point and stare at that point and ask yourself, what keeps me from being a canal? Well, you know, I don't want to be a canal. Okay. That's one of the things you'll have to preach through. And so maybe the way you start that sermon that day is to say, you know, you remember that old definition of fanatic? Somebody who doubles their efforts when they've forgotten their aim. I don't want to be a fanatic for you. Unless it's about sports, and maybe even then it can be overdone. But at the same time, I don't want to have nothing to say about the Lord. You know, you, you ever protected yourself so much from somebody or something that you can't enjoy a darn thing about it? I don't want to do that either. Hmm. Is there a middle place between avoidance and crazy? What would that sweet spot be? Look like. Yeah. I think a non believer, a Jewish person, a Buddhist, Catholic, fundamentalist, you could all ask that question. Okay? So, build a great introduction around your core message. Now, there are some ways to do that. I'll have you find it. I'll draw it some. Here's one. Uh, Bill Stegel is a master of this. Uh, you know, a lot of people are storytellers, and Jesus was a lot of stories. So some storytelling sermons are stories in themselves. They're events in themselves. Bill's stories usually would be images that you could hear and then keep. So as we consider these ideas for better preaching, his ideas were uh, like, okay, uh, he, one time, this is his sermon. I went to the Arco gas station last week. And as I'm walking out, I, I see this kid walking. And there's somebody right behind him. And he sees me. I'm sure he does. But he left the door shut. Now, you know, it doesn't hurt you to have to open the door at Arco. But I thought, you know, it used to be. Everybody kind of knew with it. If you saw somebody coming in your door, you sort of push the door open a second punch so that they had the feeling like you opened the door for them. I like that better. When somebody acknowledges I'm coming in a door and they're coming out the door and they give a little push and said, I'm helping too. And then he starts walking through his sermon. And then mid-sermon, he comes back to the Arco door. He says, you know, I, I, I think of the way Jesus is relating to this guy, and I think, you know, it's like the Arco door. Jesus gives an extra push just to get the guy through the door. He gets to the end of his sermon. And he says, you know, I think all of us, all the time, are walking through the Arco door. I'd like to give you some suggestions about how to handle the Arco doors in your life. First of all, there are going to be some people who pay no attention to you. So number one, practice forgiving the ones who don't watch you and help you through the door. Number two, though, maybe if you look twice, Somebody you're passing by and ask yourself, is there a door they're passing through that I'm coming out of? And so his sermon starts in the middle and at the end with an image of thoroughgoing interest. I listened to another sermon he did about a bird, and I was taken with this sermon because 
that bird image kept coming through. Now, that's a hard sermon to write. A thoroughgoing image means you better have pondered. But I learned a device from somebody years ago. Um, tell me real quickly, what's one thing that happened to you on the way here? I need one sentence of like a boring night. Tell me something you did today on the way here. Had to wait in line for the bus. Had to wait in line for the bus. Okay. Yeah, step one was the bus. Okay, step one is good. We now have two perfect images for a whole sermon. What happens a lot of times we're going, oh, I need to find a It's going to be really hard. Look, waiting in line in the bathroom, there's 50 different ways you can build off that metaphor and give me something where I'm done with your sermon and I'm going to go, it's like waiting in line. You stuck behind a truck, I'm telling you what, you can. So, those of you who are thinking, oh, I could never do that, you need to know it's a lot easier than it sounds if you work the message around that image. As a matter of fact, trying to get a really hard, complicated thing, you probably aren't going to know this way. Build it walking through an arch of the Build it the way a certain bird sweeps in its yard. This, you know. Okay? And work from that. So, if you're going to try this, try it real simple. You've got to have a point. I hope your point's related to four points in a series. I hope you asked yourself what's going to keep me from that point. I hope the point, by the way, is rooted in the scripture that you've been looking at. I hope you, then you ask that question, what's going to keep me from it? Then I hope you say, well, you know, gosh, sometimes I just feel like I don't ever get to God. Like I'm waiting in line for the bathroom. Okay, good. I could come around to that. I could come around to that. Come around to that. Waiting behind the truck. I could come around to that. In that sermon on seeking this Sunday. I could do it this Sunday. I could take this, you know, this looking for God and sending Moses instead of me. <coughs> because when I feel, try to go to God, I feel like I'm waiting in line at the bathroom. And I could come back to that and back. You never wait in line for the bathroom so long, you're thinking, I really, I really don't like this now. Yeah, I don't like it when I seek God and I don't find it. I'll send somebody else. It's easy to find a thoroughgoing image if you'll not make it hard. If you make it hard, 